Hi. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Shai Kameen Brown. I'm Director of Product Marketing for Low Power AGI with Synaptics. And what are you showing here? So we're showing various applications, primarily using our DBM10L Low Power Audio AGI chip. Um, so one of the key applications we're showing here is uh, sound event detection. So I can uh, play various sounds using this speaker over here, and uh, you'll see various devices detecting it, all happening in extremely low power. So we're talking about between one and three or four milliwatts while detecting the, uh, uh, the sounds. And this is thanks to the uh, low power capabilities of our chip, which is, as I said, a low power audio edge AI chip, which includes both a DSP and a uh, neural network processor. So uh, I see the chip is right there. Is that the one in the middle there? Yeah, this one over here is the chip, DBM10L. This is one of the packages, QFN package. There's also a, uh, a CSP package, which is much smaller. All right. All right, so how does it work? So uh, first thing I want to show is uh, glass break detection. So I'm going to play glass break on this phone, the glass break sound. Uh, it's going to go to this speaker over Bluetooth. The speaker will play out the sound. It will be picked up by this device over here, the white device that includes our chip in it, our low power edge AI chip with a single microphone. This LED will turn on. And then the device also have us, has our ULE long range, low power, uh, wireless technology that will send a message to this uh, device over here, this commercial Fritz box, which will then send a ULE message over to this device that will turn on. So let's see all of this happening in real time. So I'm playing the sound on here. It's picked up by this device. Okay. And the light turns on, all happening wirelessly. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing I want to play is uh, Baby Cry. So this uh, device will play the Baby Cry sound. And this device, which is connected to one of our EVBs, will pick up the sound using my, one microphone, running a different neural network on the same chip, and play back a confirmation that uh, the baby crying was detected. So I'm playing it now. Detected baby cry. So hopefully the sound is uh, high enough, and you could hear the device saying "detected baby cry." It's like a trigger. Yeah, it's, it's a, a trigger word, exa no, but it's, it's a, not trigger... a trigger word. It's a trigger sound. Sound. Yeah. It could be any baby. It's not well, the same any baby. baby every yes, time? of course. Any baby, just like any glass break, any gunshot, any uh, we detect toilet flush for some customers of ours. Uh, next one is we have a really nice industrial application, which is really recently made by our partner Imagimob, and so you'll see. Uh, I'm going to play a welding sound. This is what a good weld sounds like. So it's playing out of this speaker picked up by a microphone over here, and you can see on the screen that we are detecting this is a good weld. Now I can also play a bad welding sound, picked up by the same device. And now you're gonna see that it's supposed to say bad weld, maybe we can edit this later. Let me try again. Yeah. So, so you see now it says bad weld. Okay, okay. it says bad weld because this belt uh, this weld was not good. Okay. Is there a difference uh, when you play the sound from the speaker or actually happening? It's a different echoes and everything. Yeah, it's and you are real time is actually, real yeah, all those demos, of course, have some uh, some limitations to them. How do you program a, a scene? How do you program something so you want to detect? So the way these things are constructed is using uh, multiple samples. Uh, we're talking about hundreds, sometimes multiple thousands of samples that are provided. Either we collect them or the customer collects them. And then uh, we have ways of training, basically training an AI model. Uh, this is done offline. And then loading that model onto the chip in real time to detect these, uh, these specific sounds. Now, a similar technology can be used for detecting keywords. So in this case, this is a commercial um, remote control from Hisense that's uh, used with this uh, premium TV from Hisense. And this has the same chip, uh, DBM10L, with a couple of microphones a keyword detection algorithm from Amazon, and the microphones uh, run our own noise suppression algorithm and beamforming. So I can say, Alexa, go home. So this is your standard Alexa experience on a remote control. And what's special here is because of the low power capabilities of our chip, um, you can design devices that last, in this case, maybe something like a year on a couple of AA batteries. Really? In the case of these devices... And it's listening all the time. Yeah, it's listening all the time. In the case of these devices, this device, for instance, could last five years 
on a couple of CR123 batteries, or something like three and a half years on three AA batteries. So it's a very, very long life, which allows our customers to deploy these devices to places where ins installation is not easy. So you don't have to draw any power lines, basically. You just lick and stick. You know, put this on a wall somewhere, stick it on the wall, it lasts five years. The last thing I want to show, this is biometric voice authentication. So in this case, it's the same chip, the DBM10L, running a, uh, an application or a software from a partner of ours called My Voice. And in this case, uh, this is biometric voice authentication. So earlier I enrolled My Voice in this, and it's a very simple enrollment, uh, just saying a certain command five or six times. And then when I'm talking, you can see if you turn the camera here, you can see when I'm talking, it says authenticated. You see, and that's, that's really uh, what says that, that the device is authenticating my voice. Now, if somebody else talks, it's not going to authenticate them. You can enroll multiple people, and you can do, use this for various security application, uh, applications, parental controls, and things like that. And this, just like all the other demos, is done in sub-5 milliwatts while it's detecting, and so you can last a very long time on some batteries. How does that work? How can you make it such low power? So the main trick, well, first of all, we've been designing chips for many years, so we know how to design them to, for very low power. And we have tricks in our software for that as well. But the main thing here is the fact that we have a neural network, uh, M sorry, neural network accelerator, basically an NPU, integrated into the chip. And so when you design a neural network model, software that is, to run on that processor, on that core, it can run in extremely low power. That's how we do it. So, AI, neural networking, yep. AI basically. works at two milli, what do you call it? One, one to five milliwatts. Milliwatts. Between one and five milliwatts, yeah. There you have, that's very low power. That's extremely AI. low power, correct, yes, yes. That's contrary to what you do, for instance, chips like from you know, NVIDIA and guys like that who do very high performance. For us, the trick here and the focus is low power. Uh, one thing I've always wanted to do with my Hey Google and everything and uh, is to give it my own name, uh, to customize the trigger words. Yeah. Is that something yeah. that's potentially possible with these kinds of devices? Yeah, it's not just potentially, it's totally possible. Yeah. So I could say, hey John, if I wanted yeah, basically the device, they're, they're, if the device, the people who sell the device uh, let me do that, yeah. and they put your chip, yeah. in theory they could let me train any trigger yeah. word I yeah, want. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, Google and Amazon will never do that. But other companies will. But why wouldn't they? They uh, well, that's a branding exercise. They want also people to say Google a thousand times at home every exactly. week. Exactly. So they remember the Google, the Google brand. But also for quality, um, when you train a wake word extensively, like Google and Amazon have, and like we have in this case, then or Hisense did, uh, you can get very high quality. These models where you you train your own wake word, they're never as high quality. They're never as their performance is never as good as something that's trained offline with a very very uh, but long. But the more process. you use it, the better it gets. So that's not uh, how it works. That needs to be developed. It needs to you be developed. Can, yeah, but you it could might develop be good enough for. Like yeah, it's good. It's good enough for some applications. Yeah, it always depends on you know what distance you want to get, what noise you have in the environment, uh, how important the performance is. Those kinds of things need to be considered. And what do these Hey Google kind of devices have compared to what you do? You have a dedicated chip that does the wake word stuff, or they also do, or they do differently? So or? It, de it depends. We have uh, devices that, that do Hey Google detection, just like here I showed you Alexa detection. So we have, we have those as well. Um, uh, what we do that's special compared to, for instance, your standard Amazon Echo Dot or Google Home is that we do this in very low power. You haven't seen much, and you've seen actually very, very few Google, OK Google enabled and Alexa enabled devices running on battery power. Yeah, that's amazing to have such low power. Is this the lowest power in the world for this um, kind of application? It probably is, yes. Which it's always li ready, always listening. Always you don't ready, need to push a button to start it. Yes, no push to talk. Well, this device also has push to talk option, but the point is, if you if you have to hold the device in order to activate it, you might as well press the buttons. But the idea is it's on the coffee table. I'm not touching it. I'm just talking it from far away. I don't have to do anything. Just sit back on my sofa and talk. And it's good to have it closer to you. The TV is far away. It might yeah, not be as good that as... always helps with performance. But we have, like I said, we have two microphones here. And we run our own algorithms, very, very high performance algorithms for noise suppression. And we actually use beamforming here. 
And so even when it's pretty far away from the user on the coffee table and not directly close proximity to the user, and even when the TV is playing full volume, it'll still pick up your wake word. Actually, this environment here in Embedded World is extremely noisy. So that's why I'm talking so, so loud. It's very hard to even hear ourselves talk. And this device can still pick up my keyword. Nice. And maybe we can speak with your colleagues also. Yes, please the go booth. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank Thanks a lot. Hi. Hi. Uh, so please introduce yourself. What are you showing here? So my name is François Béchon. I'm FAE for Synaptics. And today we are going to present the uh, TDDI uh, technology from Synaptics. So what we are doing is that we are selling... Let me get started. Yeah. Let me jump right here. Yep. So we are... Yep selling TDDI, so touch and display driver IC, uh, to uh, display manufacturer. So the purpose uh, of this device is to drive the display, so to display the content, and also deal with the touch, touch aspect. So we are selling one component to the display manufacturer. Here we are selling, showing here what is currently sold in the EV uh, car in the US, uh, Lucid. It's showing the display technology. Here it's an active part active part as well. If we have freeform display, so it's not only rectangular, we can deal with freeform, uh, both on both sides here and there, and it's curved as well. So meaning the, the silicone that we sell can also bend. So this is part of the thing that we can deal with. Um, silicone that you sell, so there's a chip, and there's displays, and there's the, like the display and the touch. But everything is in one chip? Everything is in one chip, but we sell the silicone only to the display manufacturer. They put it on the glass and it's done. We provide the solution for the display and the touch. What is the silicone you're talking about? This device, TDDI, touch TDDI. and display driver IC. And the chip is somewhere? The, the chip is glued on the display right here somewhere, just beneath, just beneath there. And then there is a glass which is glued, which is assembled over it. Is that how every touch display is made? Right now, yes, because it's, it's a new technology. The advantage of this technology, which is called in-cell, is that it's cheaper. It also has a better optic performances because you have less layer, so you have less um, reflectance from the light. So it's better. Uh, so there's been a lot of development over the last decade in capacitive touch. Yeah. And is this like the best, most advanced yes. implementation yes. of capacitive touch? Yes, it's capacitive touch. The most advantage of that is uh, also it's naturally immune to humidity, to uh, humidity, to uh, uh, moisture, and it's really advantageous. It's a lot, a lot of... Uh, Performance is very good with a... Uh, um, satisfaction of the con customer, the, the touch is, is happening efficiently, yes. precisely. It's really precise. We have, uh, we have a lot of advantages within Synaptics, especially on the edge and uh, regarding, yeah, it's really, really good, really good solution. And on top of what we are showing here in this example, uh, we are also promoting the knob on display. Yeah. It's a rotary wheel. So then you have a wheel right on the, onto the display. Yes, exactly. It's glued on the display. It's using the touch electrode that are on the display. There is no, I would say, there is no additional component no needed, right? And the beauty of this solution is that it does not rely on the coupling of your end to the display because it's using the, the touch on the, that are already existing on the display. So basically, I can use chopped sticks to, uh, to, 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 to do the rotation. It will detect it. Chopsticks? Yeah. Right. I can use uh, maybe something yeah. like my... Uh, but it's nice to have something physical, but still touch screen. Everything is integrated from the one to the other. Yeah. And the beauty of this solution is that because of the incel technology used, I can use, I'm, I'm using here tissue. Which is not conductive. To, yeah, it's not conductive, and I can still detect the rotation, right? So you see I'm rotating, and it's been detected. That's the beauty of the technology. Can you say if this chipset 
is an ARM or what is inside the ch uh, it's what is our architecture? Own, it's our own uh, processor, which is your own design. Yeah, it's own design. It's yeah. own architecture. Do you sell millions and millions of these? Yes, around the world. We have Are you one of the market leaders. Uh, the competition yes. is tough, but yeah, we are among the best uh, best seller in the world at the moment. Nice. And here, what we are selling is uh, pr pr um, presenting here also is the local deming. So the intention of the local deming is to. So this is the new device that we are promoting at the moment. It's the SP7800. The yeah. purpose is to do local deming. So. On top of the fact that it has, it can drive the touch and display driver IC, it can also drive the backlight uh, which is beneath, uh, um, behind the display. So traditionally, when you have this kind of display, you have uh, what we call the HLED. So this is what we call full dimming. It's only the LED, the LEDs are always light on. Okay? The move to the local dimming, you have plenty of LEDs behind the display, but you only light on those you are needed. So for instance, on this picture, on this picture here, you see the black content. So because it's black, you don't need, basically you don't need to light on this LED. You only need to light on the LEDs which are there. And this is what you can achieve here. By doing this, you have a much better contrast. Is this what they call mini LED no, backlight? Yeah, yeah, kind of, because it's uh, um, it's based on the fact that you you, you drive LEDs, uh, but they are not LEDs that are uh, responsible for the for the for the for the um, for the pixels. It's, it's the backlight LEDs. So you run the backlights also. So we drive the backlight by doing so. You so. drive the backlight. The touch, the display. And the display. That's a, what's left. Uh, audio. <laughs> audio. I saw something else. Yeah. And w what do we see here? So, so that's the. Here, here we see the, uh, the the demonstration of the local demo. Yeah. So here on this uh, on this on this particular uh, display, the local demo is not on. So you see here on the on the side, there is black, but it's not real black. If I enable now the local dimming, you will see that the black will be a very dark black. You see? Here now it's enabled. I will disable again. It's black, but it's not black. Here it's black, black. And this is how we achieve a very high con contrast ratio. It looks like OLED. Yeah, but the advantage... It's but it's LCD. And the real good advantage with respect to OLED is that it's TFT, it's a well-known technology. It's more affordable, uh, maybe? It's, uh, potentially. Yeah, potentially, but also it's less expensive. And also, in terms of uh, aging, it's much more uh, reliable with respect to the age compared to OLED. The factory yeah. is very big for the LCD. Yes. It's maybe easier it's to a make known, millions and millions of Exactly, them. it's a known uh, technology. And although you deal with multiple, much more yeah, sure. LED to drive, you can do much brighter also, potentially. potentially Brightness. But when you're in a car, you want to be able to see the screen. Yeah, that's why the local dimming in the car is, has a lot of uh, advantages. All right. Uh, it's basically HDR? Uh, it's 8 bit. Okay. It's 8 bit content. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. We only deal with the. We, we have a lot of. Uh, image processing inside our device to improve the quality uh, of the picture in the end, together with the yeah, to drive the uh, the backlight. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Cool. Maybe I can check with some of your colleagues. Uh, David. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is David Armour. I'm Head of Wireless Connectivity Sales in Europe for Synaptics. So what's the latest in wireless connectivity? Well, in addition to a, a large range of low-power, high-performance Wi-Fi and Bluetooth solutions, we've just recently brought out a new family of products, which is the 4381 and 4382, uh, one of which we've just recently won an award the uh, last couple of days. Uh, uh, so here it says winner, winner of in the wireless connectivity 
category? That's correct. So what is, uh, what is the product? The product is a, a single-chip solution that has uh, a Wi-Fi radio. Uh, in this case, it's two Wi-Fi radios plus a Bluetooth 5.2 core uh, and also support for 802.15.4, Thread and Matter all in a single chip. One chip for all these things. Yep. That's special? It is. It's very unique in a number of ways. And the single chip allows you to create products supporting all those different protocols. In addition, the Wi-Fi radio can operate on the 2.4, 5 and 6 gigahertz bands. And this particular chip can run on two frequency bands at the same time. So this enables lots of really interesting applications, particularly for heavy media, media applications. Uh, in my, as I understand, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is the same spectrum or something like that? And is Matter also over there in the same one? Yes, it is. And part of the challenge is of the radios is that whether share a frequency band, that there can be interference and potentially jamming between them. So if you're doing this on a single chip, then it's needed to have some really advanced coexistence mechanisms on the radios so they work together well. And uh, we've been doing this for a very long time now uh, to getting really great performance while using the, the Wi-Fi and also streaming over Bluetooth for, for the audio. And it also enables us to, to reduce the number of antennas needed. So is this on there, right there? Yes. Where is your chip? Somewhere inside? On, the chip is oh, on, sorry. The, on the small reference design that's here. On the back side of it or something? Yeah. Yeah. So it's right there. And this is a demo that's running? It is. The demo we're running is we're demonstrating a feature we call real simultaneous dual band. So the radio is connected to the 2.4 gigahertz network for infrastructure. So we're streaming content in from the internet. And then with the other radio, we're setting up a, a local access point. And we're streaming that out on six gigahertz band to a number of small displays. From one to a number of displays. And what is the protocol for that? It's, it's a feature that we have called RSDB. It's real simultaneous dual band. It's a quite a unique feature because it's enabling us to, to coordinate two radios working at the same time on the chip, coordinating the traffic on the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth, uh, plus the other protocols and also enabling a reduced number of antennas. So it makes a very small solution and reduces the cost. And um, what do you need to have running these devices? Just Wi-Fi support and that's it? Yeah, these are just standard little little tablets connected to the, the five or the six gigahertz network. You connect to the Wi-Fi network and then... Over here. And then the app supports your protocol, and boom, you receive the signal. Yes. You receive the video. So, so any any Wi-Fi standard device can connect to our radio, with fully standards compliance, uh, interoperable, and and stream and connect the the data. This app is special. No, nope, it's it's within the Synaptic software. It's running on on the chip. All right. Uh, and. Uh, can you describe a little bit what happens with the matter? Why are so many people talking about matter here in the yeah. inventor world? And why is it great to have everything and matter on the chip? Yeah. I think the thing with matter is, matter is, uh, is where the industry has come together. Um, five, six hundred companies already, uh, where it's enabling devices developed by different companies to be able to share data with each other in a way that they couldn't do before. So a lot of home automation systems could be siloed. For example, a garage door opener, wouldn't talk to your alarm system, wouldn't talk to your heating system. Now with Matter, that data can be exchanged. And, and with our devices here, which support this, it enables a, a small gateway to be made where you can aggregate that together within the smart home or smart factory in a, in a very, very efficient way. Some of the other uh, standards have been, people are talking about Zigbee and stuff like that, uh, because they, there it was a challenge in range or how is Matter range? <coughs> Is, does it matter? Or? <laughs> does it matter? Oh, okay. Sorry. You've been wasting all day to say that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, um, what, what is from a protocol point of view? Uh, Zigbee had a number of different profiles, and it was challenging to get them to interoperate in, in some ways. Uh, with, with Matter, this is where the wider industry has come together and defined a, a way for these devices to talk in a, in a certified and interoperable way, which is, which is a great step forward. It's similar in a way to the Wi-Fi Alliance. So anyone who's Wi-Fi certified, their product will talk to other devices which are Wi-Fi certified. All right. 
Uh, so when we look here, does it mean when you show these fa very famous devices, they all have cement, uh, some of your chips in there? Yes. The, the part of the table here, the very latest generation of products we, that we've spoken about. Uh, these products are already shipping based upon earlier versions of our chips. Uh, things from the, the, the DJI drone, uh, there's a Google Nest doorbell, uh, some, uh, some tablets, and there's a wide range of other devices, uh, particularly in IoT, uh, wearables, where the very low power consumption of the synaptic radios is, is so important. All right. Uh, and it goes all the way down, or there's more demos over there? Where it says, or, oh, what's so, happening there? So we mentioned uh, uh, a BLE. So in, in Bluetooth 5.2, that's in our latest chips, we're adding in support for the LE audio streaming. And the demo we have here is, is um, the volume is down, because it's so noisy here. But we're taking uh, a content from a video, and the video has multi-language soundtracks on it. And we're streaming that, that audio content out to BLE speakers. And we're doing it to two different sets of stereo speakers to demonstrate we can do multi-language streaming, which is a feature of multi-channel streaming of, of LE that's so important. Um, the great thing as well is LE uh, is extremely low power compared to uh, Bluetooth Classic, so enabling battery life to be way, way longer than before. Yeah, they've been talking about the Bluetooth BLE, which is fantastic generation that just saves a lot of power. Yes. And you have it implemented in the best possible way. Yeah, our radios actually support Bluetooth dual mode. So they have the classic Bluetooth uh, with all the profiles which have been used for many, many years. And we also have the BLE radio in there as well. So we can support legacy and all the new applications on, on BLE. All right, cool. Uh, so this is probably, I guess, in millions of devices out there. Your, your a very, existing... A very large number of devices, yes. All right, cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, let's go, let's go around here. Hi. 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 Sorry. Uh, Hi. Uh, please introduce yourself. What are you talking about here? Hi. Yeah, I'm Vineet Genju. I uh, run the audio business unit in Synaptics. So what we're showing here today is a new technology we call Resonate. Resonate is a new audio amplifier technology that drives a piezo uh, transducer, which basically allows you to use the display or any surface as a speaker. So this allows you to uh, eliminate traditional dynamic speakers and replace it with something that's actually already part of the product, like the display in a phone, for example. You need to put something behind that vibrates the whole thing? Yeah, so it's a piezoelectronic material, a transducer, that's attached to the back of the display. And then there's a special amplifier technology that drives that transducer. And in this case, we're showing it attached to a, a phone uh, panel, but it could be attached to the plastics or wood or any other type of surface. So Has just... there been some uh, phones already that do that? That instead of having a little speaker, they do it through the display? Yeah, there's been some phones that have done it, but they don't use a piezo material. They use an LRA motor. An LRA motor is typically used for haptics to vibrate a display to get that haptic feedback. But that LRA motor doesn't give you very good audio quality. So with the piezo, it allows you to get the same audio quality or actually better audio quality than you get with traditional speakers. But you get the benefits of a slimmer form factor. Now you can reduce the thickness because you eliminate the speaker. It's lower power consumption. Um, you actually can get haptic feedback through the, um, through the same material. So you can eliminate the LRA motor and you don't need holes in the industrial design to allow the audio to come out. So it's naturally waterproof and dustproof as well. There was like a phone a few years ago, and they were talking about getting rid of the bezel, and then they would not even even need the speaker grill. Exactly. And they would just do it through the phone. Yeah. But it's not as high quality, but you, you're going to match the quality of a real speaker? Right, exactly. You're right, it was done in the past. Um, you can eliminate the bezel, eliminate the speaker grill. But as I said, that was using a LRA motor technology, so it didn't get the same audio quality. With this, we can match or actually exceed the. You echo. match, you yeah. match, you exceed. You say how yeah. do you exceed it? Because it's a bigger surface. Yeah, uh, you can exceed in, because of yeah, it's a bigger surface that allows you to get a better frequency spectrum, a flatter frequency spectrum across more frequencies. 
um, and it allows you to get better perceived loudness because now the sound is coming directly at the user instead of going out of the side or out Does of the back. Does it feel like your phone is a 7.1? Does it feel like you, you get all the different areas of the phone making different sounds or it's just uh, it one sound source going out? It depends on how many transducers you use. So in this yeah, case, we we're uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. In this case, we're using two transducers. So to basically sound like a stereo um, uh, speakers. Yeah, it's just a question of copyright. But uh, for the music, that's oh, yeah, why I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, uh, LG has been shipping some TVs that have it in, or Sony right. and LG yeah. uh, that have it inside the display. Yeah. And you bring it down to any device? Yeah, so LG and Sony have it in the TVs, as you mentioned. Um, what our technology allows you to do is do it in smaller form factors. Uh, running off batteries because in this case we're we're operating this at very low noise and very low power consumption, so it allows you to do it in devices like phones, tablets, PCs. Um, do you always need a glass? Do you always need a display, or can you do it on like uh, you can the, it to... the the plastic? Yeah, the... exactly. Yeah, it's a good what, point. What what material do you need? Yeah, any material that can vibrate basically. So it can be glass, can be plastic, can be wood. Even, you can imagine in a car, you can even attach it to a door panel or a dashboard. Metals? Metals also, if the metal can vibrate, it has to be flexible enough to vibrate. So, Not some kind of aluminum? Rigid. Yeah, like an Something aluminum, like that? A thin aluminum, for example, yeah. <laughs> can you also mix and match, like you have a little bit of glass, a little bit of uh, metal, a little bit of plastics, and somehow they all resonate at the same time? Or it's you have to pick what you d where you put your resonation? Yeah, it's theoretically possible to mix, but it depends on the properties of the, that particular material and, and how it resonates. Uh, do you have other demos? Um, so this is a sound portion of Resonate, and what this is showing is that this technology can also be used for uh, haptics feedback. So it allows you to vibrate the screen so without the audio so that you can get that, you know, that vibration, the touch uh, haptics response. It allows you to do force sense as well, so it can tell how, how hard a person is touching on the display. So if you want to do a force touch type application, if you're touching quickly or for a couple seconds, you can get a different type of response. Uh, is, is this, here it says also, the winner uh, for sensors category, uh, is this mass production or is it in the future? Uh, it's sampling today. It'll be mass production later this year. And is when you talk about haptics in the phones, they have vibrations and stuff when you use a keyboard. Right. How does that compare uh, the feeling of the, the haptics? Yeah, so with the piezo, so today they use a motor, an LRA motor to get that haptics feedback. In this case, you use a piezo material. You can get a much sharper, um, crisper uh, haptics feedback. So it allows you to get a, even a better experience than what you get in the phone today. Is it possible that you can even um, get the feeling of touching, for example, uh, uh, plastic or wood or glass, or like it, it vibrates in a different way. It gives you the feeling you're touching something different. Uh, you or mean if you're touching glass and it makes it feel like you're touching plastic, for example? Or wood or something. Uh, I don't Does know, that make actually, sense? to be honest. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. We haven't I don't actually know if that's tried an that. application. Yeah, it's a yeah. good idea. We've never tried that. Yeah. But you can shape the, the haptics feedback response to however you want. I mean, you're just uh, basically playing out an audio file vibrating at certain frequencies. So. The people that have problem uh, seeing, they also need special haptic devices to potentially um, uh, get a s sense the surroundings. Right. Maybe that could be some applications too. Yeah, exactly. If yeah. you have more granularity in the yeah, in the can, haptic feedback. Yeah, you can have more granularity of you know, both both cases. Either how hard you're touching, or for how long you're touching, as well as um, the feedback. Like you said, it could be a short pulse or a long pulse. Or a, and it's the same like device that does the sound and the haptic feedback. Correct. Yeah, same device that does. It's both. just different different frequency range that is playing back the uh, audio of how those. Right. You get better bass or? Um, no, you don't get better bass with piezo. You get a better, flatter frequency response across all the frequency band, but you won't get a louder bass necessarily. The bass is, you know, has to do with the size of the material itself. Could you also combine it with regular speakers? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So if you want a better bass or a louder bass, then you could combine it with a subwoofer or a low frequency traditional dynamic speaker and mix the two. And get kind of like a home theater experience from exactly. a little device. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. You can get a 5.1 or 7.1 type of experience. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, let's go around right here. All right.
Hey. 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 How are you? Good. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Siddharth Chandrasekhar. I'm Senior Director of Marketing for our Multimedia SOCs. Uh, we're showcasing here a bunch of solutions yeah. uh, in SOCs. Actually, let's uh, what's start What's your SOC? Here. Is, like, is that the big one there? Yes, that's the evaluation kit. It's there? Yes. So you make the big chip? No, 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 that's the heat sink. So ah, it's sorry. actually something like this. There. That's the chip. Um, so can you explain what are we seeing here? So this is actually a system on module. So you'll have the chip plus the memory and, uh, and a few things. So you get a small system or module. This is the kind of form factor you fit it in. This is a kind of similar to banana pie. So it's actually, uh, sorry, uh, uh, raspberry pie. We call it banana pie. So it's based on 680. So it's uh, fully functional. Is it an ARM? ARM, this is uh, Quad A73, uh, ARM Quad A73 with a GPU and a powerful NPU. So like seven, uh, nearly seven tops uh, NPU. That's so powerful. That, that's very powerful, and that's why you can see all this complex AI use cases that you can do. So here is doing full body pose estimation of all the people. Um, that's a different use case where you can see based on depth. So this camera is just a single camera. It doesn't have uh, uh, stereoscopic, but based on kind of depth, it is choosing what's the foreground, what's the background, and blurring it out. Nice. They're all, they're all sorts of kind of use cases that we're doing. Uh, has uh, Synaptics been doing SOC, ARM SOCs for a long time? Yes, so actually this dates back to the acquisition of Marvel's uh, uh, multimedia SOCs. They've been doing it since the early 2010s. We've continued doing it, we acquired it in 2017. So we've got, we are actually on our sixth generation now, uh, which is the 680 and the 640, that's what you're seeing. And our main key differentiator outside of the full video the decode and display pipeline is the AI capabilities. And when you see this banana pie right there, uh, is there a big community? If you can grab, let's grab it right here. Yeah. Is it this one? Uh, is there a big community developers? So, uh, so this has just been kind of launched, so it's still in the ramp phase. But there is a different version of the banana pie, which is more or less the same thing. This is actually a Baidu pie. Uh, let me just come right here. So, Baidu pie. Yes, Baidu, uh, which is obviously the, Baidu is the like, there? it's the same chip, the 680, but uh, all of Baidu's AI models have been ported there. It's being distributed across all sorts of universities is in it China. Is 96 boards? Or does the form factor, it's just uh, similar to a Raspberry similar Pi? Similar to a Raspberry Pi, exactly. Yeah. So it's a different version of, uh, it's a slightly different because it's designed by Baidu. And it's got the same ARM Cortex A73 and everything? That's correct. And uh, A55? It's the same basic. The A55 is the 640. Uh, but, uh, on the big one, you also have small cores? No. Only, only big? Only big. Only big. But the big is scalable? Uh, it's still not using too much power? Scalable. Everything can be turned on and off individually. Uh, the other advantage of our AI engine is it's fully within the trusted execution environment. So it's fully secure. Nobody can ever touch the data or the model as well as you can operate models on any type of content. So think of in the in like a set-of-box world, an operator has launched a service where you can run object detection on any content, whether it's broadcast, YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, doesn't matter, because you're never breaking any of the DRM or security protocols. Uh, here's asking, uh, what's the package called? Uh, so what's the platform, what's it called? Uh, so this is called Banana Pie. Yeah. Uh, our actual SOC is the VS680, which is the Quad A73, and uh, the lower end device is a VS640, which is Quad A55. And both have NPU engines. Uh, the NPU on the 680 is seven tops, NPU on the 640 is one and a half tops. Are you in many, like, when I, when I see their, this so kind yes. of device, so this, it will be inside? Yep, this is a center box. This is actually like a splitter, a video splitter or a video wall device. It can take six inputs and output one, 680 powering that. This is like an enterprise video conferencing device. It might even be 4K or... We are in smart displays. We are in um, appliances. So again, combination of using the display and video, but also the AI to make uh, decisions about temperature, ingredients, and, and the camera and stuff like that. So it comes from the... 
Marvel Amarda stuff that, is that, exactly, that is exactly right. But there's Total a evolution. part of that that goes in a different market that stays in Marvel? That's correct. And you, you have We that. took the video side of it. Basically, the multimedia processors has come over to Synaptics. And how good are your video processors? You can do 8K, 4K? So, no, uh, the 680 can d decode two 4K P60 simultaneously, or many more lower resolution. The 640 can do one 4K P60 plus one 1080 P60. Do you have a lot of partners working on different projects with this? Yes, so bo both products are already in mass production, shipping in millions of units today. Millions? Yes. And uh, what do we see here? Can you hold so, this? Yeah. Uh, what is What are these different boards? We, yes, this base, uh, just different boards with different uh, connectivity options. And they're all using the same chip? They're all using the same chip. And there's a bigger one there? Correct. Um, and this one is more for like development or? Uh, this is I think meant for more the uh, the kind of video uh, soundbar that you see. So uh, supporting dual camera and even more interfaces going out. Do you support Linux? Linux and uh, in two flavors, both uh, Ubuntu and uh, uh, Yocto, as well as Android AOSP, but also Android TV flavor because of the... What kind of customers do the, and the Ubuntu and the Yocto? What do they use it for? like the appliance or security so mainly in the industrial space it's mainly Yocto in the in the consumer space it's primarily uh, Android then in this kind of enterprise space it's a mix some are Android some are you also have like smaller we also have video phones IP phones that instead of just audio they also support video those are also Android based but the simpler ones can be Yocto and uh, here when I look here uh is it this, this, one? this is just using as one of the inputs for this splitter. So because this can take six inputs, so if I show this, so you can see I can kind of show six inputs at one time. So we've got six inputs coming in, two from the that camera you see there, one is the AI demo running off the Baidu board, and three are just like set of boxes that have been plugged in there. What do we see here? Um, is that a Raspberry Pi? Yeah. Running, so it's not one of your boards? Not one of ours. All right. It's just using to power this demo. <laughs> All right. Uh, so lots of projects happening yes. at the Embedded World. Absolutely. Lots of advancements. advancements. Yes, and uh, part of what we're doing here is that we've got some of these songs, but we're looking for more partners to build some other variants and extending our uh, ecosystem of partners here. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. And go around right here. <laughs> Two business models. All right. Let's finish the bush tour. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, please introduce yourself. So I'm Elad Baram, and uh, I'm running the marketing here in Synaptics for the Low Power Vision AI. So I see uh, this stuff there. Yeah, Are you this, in there? This stuff there is uh, it's it's an Edge SoC. Uh, it's named Katana. Uh, the defining factor here is power, so it's a very, very low power processor. It has an M33 uh, um, ARM core, uh, high frame speed DSP, and a uh, tiny NPU. And it's actually a microcontroller that is capable of both vision AI and uh, audio uh, AI. Vision and audio AI. What audio yeah. AI does it do? So it can do sound event detection and um, things like, like that. Here in this demo, it's actually showing all the vision capabilities. So on the here on uh, oh here the TV just no here here it's uh, showing um, a human detection uh, models. This is targeting actually like a smart human sensor, so application like battery operated device. So today they are all um, activated by a motion sensor, but now we want to augment the capability and actually um, keep them as a battery operated device, but say, hey, this is not just a motion, we are seeing a face, we are seeing a person, we are seeing a car, we are seeing a dog. So having something which is more... Um, and it's um, very low power. It, it, th this one is working uh, on, on just a few tens of uh, milliwatt when it's on uh, active and on microwatt when it's not... Uh, so it, it sounds it's crazy. Very, it sounds it's crazy. much lower than a security camera a, a, power consumption. A, a regular camera, you would take about one watt when it's working on uh, on active. So this is like and you one tenth you're using of the thousand power. times less. We are we are, uh, we are no, about one tenth. So hundred times is, uh, less. Uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's this is this is the. What it's just a doing. small part 
of a security camera? Yeah, you can use it as a small part of the security camera if you want the security camera to be always on. Or you just can make it as a standalone sensor, like a smart sensor, and use it something that would sense the environment and, and, and then can send uh, the metadata to the, um, to the control panel saying, hey, we are seeing there was some motion here, we are seeing a person, you should take care of that. And not necessarily send the image out, because sometimes privacy is a concern. So one of the um, advantages of having those um, analysis on the edge is that you don't need to send the image out in order to do the inference. So everything is happening on device. All right. And this mass production is available? Yeah, this is available it's brand new? in mass production. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we have a few designs going on. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Cool. All right. Um, and that's here in the other one, this showing a face detection. So this is a little bit different use case. It's actually, so there is a new category which we call an HPD, uh, uh, human presence de uh, detection. Sometimes it's actually a user presence detection, which the idea here is not for the security market, but actually to make consumer electronics smarter and actually to understand whether there is a user or there is no user. So in an in, in example for in the laptop case, this is being used uh, for the system to know if the user is engaged with the content or not engaged. If it's not engaged, it will dim the screen. It can save a lot of power. When you walk away, it will automatically turn off and we lock and so on. And we believe that uh, a laptop is the only first instance of this type of uh, context awareness. And now it's starting to go to other consumer devices that can have the same benefits. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.